In the next week, or two, or maybe three, the election will finally be over, right? It might take a while. And the person that you voted for may or may not win. But I can assure you that God is still on the throne. He is not up for re-election. He is, he is a part of, he is an everlasting king, right? Without beginning or without end. And his principles, his values, his purposes, the word of God, prevail, they endure. It says this in Proverbs 19, 21. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart. But once you say that with me out loud at all our locations, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. That word prevail means endure. They last. No matter what happens, this happens. The Lord's purposes are going to prevail. And I can tell you that men, myself included, can make all sorts of proclamations and declarations and have purposes within our heart. But what it says here, it says that God's purposes, they last. They endure. They stand the test of time. And now can I tell you that one part of God's purpose, a very important, significant part of his purpose is what's actually happening right here, right now, as we gather together. This called the church, this called the family of God is from the very heart of God and is a part of his purpose. That word purpose in the Hebrew language actually means his plan. And it has always been God's plan to use his church to bring hope and life to the world all around us. He's not counting on a political party to do that. He's not counting on a candidate to do that. They do what they do, but that's not what we do. We have a different assignment on us as the church of Jesus Christ. We have a different purpose that rests on us than what other things have on them. We are called to be the body of Christ, the Bible says. We are the hands and feet of, of Jesus. When Jesus left this world, he gave us an assignment. He said, listen, the same purpose that was on my life, to bring people into a relationship with God, guess what? That's on you, the church. He gave that mission to us together. And so we get to be his hands. We get to be his feet. The scriptures say that we are the, the body of Christ. It says in Corinthians that we are the voice of God, as though God were making his appeal to the world through us. And let me tell you, if there's ever a time when the world needed to hear a message of hope and life, it is today, now more than ever, they need to hear the voice of the church speaking up and pointing people to God, amen? Now more than ever, guess what? The church needs you to be the church because the church isn't a building that we go into. You and I, we are the church. We, we are, and what we are a part of is so vitally important to the purposes of God that he wants to see happen on the planet today. You hear me say all the time out of Ephesians 1.23 that the church, it says, is not peripheral to the world, but the world is actually peripheral off to the side when it comes to the church. Not because we're better than anybody, but the mission that's on our life, the purpose that's on our life. Look what it says there. It says, because the church, here's why, is Christ's body in which he speaks and he acts and by which, say it with me, he fills everything with his presence. See, I'm afraid that, too many Christians have the church in their peripheral view, off to the side, not really that important, not really as important as everything else going on in the news and everything else going on in culture and everything else. They're just, we're focused on the wrong thing. God's saying, no, 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 get focused on the church because it's through the church I'm gonna speak and heal and move and fill everything with my presence and my power. He doesn't just want the church to be a part of our lives. He wants this to be a priority in our lives. And I wanna remind you that the church is not some man-made idea. It's actually been birthed in the heart of God himself. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter one, verse five. It says this, his, God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. So God's plan from the very beginning of time was to adopt us all into his family. Now, when you think about that word adoption, that's a very beautiful word, a very significant word. When you, when you think about uh, how beautiful and wonderful it is when a family has children and parents can conceive a child, that's great and wonderful. But uh, when, when, when parents decide we're going to adopt a, a child and they go through, they pray about it and they meet with people and they fill out all the paperwork and they pay all the money and they go through all the, the steps to do that, man, that child is wanted. 
That child is, is chosen, right? It's not like, oops, we got pregnant, how that happened? No, it's intentional, right? And that's the very word that God uses to describe how much you are wanted, how much you are loved, how much he's chosen you to be a part of his family. It says in, in 1 Peter 1, 3, that God has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. See, when you are physically born, you are born into a physical family, right? But when you are spiritually born, you're actually born into a spiritual family. Look around, you're a part of a spiritual family. And your spiritual family outlasts your physical family. Let that sink in for a minute. Your, your physical family is important. I mean, you've got to be committed to your physical family and to those relationships. I'm not saying you shouldn't be. But your physical family only lasts as long as earth lasts or as long as you're on the earth and some don't even last that long. But your spiritual family, man, it lasts forever and ever and ever and all through eternity. Like you're stuck with me, right? We're, we're stuck together. And that may scare some of you because you know somebody that's going to be in heaven and they, they wear you out. That's okay. Heaven's a big place. You can run and hide and get over there and talk and worship Jesus there, all right? But there are benefits about being in this, in this family. We, we get the family name. We have camaraderie and friendship in the family. We have 24 seven access to our heavenly father. There's purpose and, and belonging in this, in this family. And Ephesians tells us we have an inheritance in this family. And it's not just gonna be $20,000. I mean, we have an eternal inheritance in heaven, like our, our, our life forever with God. But just like any family, there's, there's benefits, but there's also some responsibilities. Like I remember when I was growing up in the Mullins family, I had to keep my room clean. I had to cut the grass. I had to take out the, the garbage and I didn't do it for an allowance. Like I had friends that got allowances. They got like 10 bucks a week for doing that kind of stuff. And I remember going to my dad going, Hey dad, where's my allowance? And he says, I'm allowing you to stay in my house. That's, that's your allowance, son. Right? I'm like, okay, I got you. There were responsibilities being a part of the family. And let me say, it's very similar to the family of God. There are responsibilities that we have to be a part of this family. I remember my parents, when I was growing up, they, they had people, friends, that if they needed a place to stay as they were kind of transitioning between apartments or whatever, they would, they would stay with us. And there was one guy, Paul, when I was back in first, second grade, I remember he was sleeping on our couch for a couple of weeks and eating our food and and eating my cereal and, and how, I remember that. And then I remember as a teenager, there was this one girl and she, a young lady, and she needed a place to stay for a couple of weeks. And a couple of weeks turned into a couple more weeks and turned into a couple months. And, and it turned into 18 months before she left our house. Like she was, she was getting all the benefits of being in the family without any of the responsibilities of being in the family. I'm afraid there's too many Christians that want the benefits of being in the family of God without doing the responsibilities of being in the family of God. There's some responsibilities here, right? There's a word for people to just hang out and don't take up any of the responsibility. Don't, don't be that, right? God's got things for you to do. In fact, in his word, there are 54 commands, directives that you cannot fulfill apart from being a part of the family of God. There are 54 one another's as it pertains to us together, to love one another, serve one another, care for one another, bear one another's burdens. You cannot do that on your own. You have to do that in the family of God and in this relationship. And here's what's awesome. As you're doing that for somebody else, somebody else is doing that for you. As you're praying for somebody and caring for somebody, there's somebody praying and caring for you. As you're bearing somebody else's burdens, there's somebody bearing your burdens. That's how God created this all to be. And together, we have a mission that we have to take responsibility for, given to us by Jesus. See, after Jesus had been crucified and raised back to life, he hung out on the earth for 40 days in his resurrected body. And he, he was witnessed by over 500 people in Jerusalem and in the Galilee. And right before he ascended up into heaven, he gave his followers these final words found in Acts chapter one, verse eight. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He's telling him, listen, you're going to go and wherever you are in Jerusalem, where you live, in Judea, the area, the region that you live in, in Samaria, the places where you are misunderstood 
And even into the uttermost parts of the world, you are to be my witness. And so then they go into Jerusalem. They wait for the Holy Spirit. They're waiting in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes, fills them with power. They boldly go out into the streets and begin to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. Peter gets up and preaches. 3,000 get saved on that day. And the church of Christ was born. Now, there's a couple things from this passage that we can learn about what's expected from us as being a part of this family. The first is that Jesus said, you will be a witness. So the first is you better get ready to speak up. You're gonna speak up for God. You have a story, a testimony of what God has done on the inside of you, and that testimony cannot stay on the inside of you. It has got to get out. You got to tell somebody the good news of Jesus. The gospel is called the good news because it's good, it's great. And people need to know about the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. Somebody's, somebody's gotta tell them. And let me just say, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this right here is for you. This isn't just for me as Pastor Todd. It's not just something that we do together as a church corporately, but it's for you. This, this is your mission. You are to be a witness. You are to speak up for God. And the good news is you got nothing to prove. He didn't say you will be my attorneys. He said you'll be my witness. What does a witness do? A witness just tells you what they know, what they saw, what they experienced. Yeah, like once I was blind, but now I can see. Once I was hopeless and alone, and now God has saved me and filled me with hope and given me purpose and surrounded me by, with a family. And that's all you gotta do is just tell people what you've experienced, but a witness has gotta open their mouth. Y yes, you can and should. Let your life tell the story of God's love. I mean, yes, you should make sure your walk and your talk all line up. But as a witness, you gotta open your mouth. On the day of Pentecost, when that happened in the book of Acts, if those people had not gone out in the street and boldly proclaimed with words who Jesus was, and if Peter had not got up and preached with words about Jesus, 3,000 people would not have gotten saved that day. You gotta open your mouth and speak up for God. Romans 10 says, how can they know unless you tell them? How can they believe in a God they have never heard of? See, that, that's why in the middle of a pandemic, we actually uh, planted a church up in Vero Beach. Hey Vero, how you doing? And do you know that just in the last couple of months, we have had hundreds and hundreds of people come and learn and grow in their walk with Jesus Christ. And I think about Jordan and Brittany and their two daughters, they've come to faith in Jesus just a couple of weeks ago. Their life is being completely transformed because we had to go and, and tell. It's why we had to go to Okeechobee and why we had to go down to downtown and why we had to go to buy a a Dillard store in the mall, why we've had to do everything and go to Belle Glade and why we're going to Riviera Beach. It's, it's why we have to go to, to tell, to open our mouth. But that's not just a, a corporate call that we have together. It's an individual call that is on your life as a part of the family of God. It says this in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, you are. You, you are God's instruments to do his work and to, what are those words? Speak out for him. You gotta speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. You are God's instruments. You're an instrument in the hands of God. Think about what an instrument does. An instrument makes noise, man. An instrument doesn't do any good sitting in a closet collecting dust. And as an instrument, you gotta speak out, you gotta make some noise. So let me ask you the question, what noise are you making? What are you speaking? What words are coming out of your mouth? What are people around you hearing? What do they need to hear? I can tell you for certain that God is counting on you to speak to those people about him. Yeah, he could come out of heaven and he could bring the heavenly angels down in chariots of fire and big, make a big entrance on your neighbor, but that would probably freak them out. So instead, he put you living right next door to him. He puts you living across the street. He puts you in the same apartment building as them. And how are they gonna know unless you tell them? That friend and coworker that on the outside, they're trying to make it look like they're all together, but down deep, man, there's something missing. And you know that that something is someone and it's Jesus and you've got the answer. You got it. That, that family member that, that God has put them in your family. 
for the very purpose for you to be able to tell them about the good news of Jesus, you gotta open your mouth and you gotta tell them there are some people that you are gonna be the only Jesus that they will ever see or experience. So make sure you speak up. Make sure you speak out. Just this week I was talking to some friends of mine that are uh, financial advisors and they were telling me a story about a, a, one of their clients and I'm not gonna give you names or anything because they didn't give me the name, it's all confidential, but they said, Todd, this one man that we've been praying for for years and he's an older gentleman and, and uh, he's, he's not a very happy man. Uh, he came into our, 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 our offices for some meetings and, and we've tried to talk to him about God before and he doesn't want anything to do with that Jesus thing is what he told him. And so after we talked to him about his financial situation, he began to open up about what was going on in his life and his wife that was suffering with cancer. And, and he said, you'll never believe it, but these people that live next door to us, they, they go to a church in a mall down in Boynton Beach and, uh, and they've been coming over and bringing us dinner and they've been praying with my wife and they're, they're just, they have so much peace. Every time they're with me, there's, there's peace in our home. And he goes, I'd never believe I'd ever be a friends with a Christian and I'd never believe. And you know what? I was sitting there laughing going, they're, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They're being instruments for God to be used in this family's life, in this man's life, to speak of the goodness and the grace of God. Does this man and his wife know Jesus yet? No, but they're going to. Let me tell you, they're gonna hear all about him because these people are living and speaking up for God. So one expectation for us in this family is that we will speak up. The second expectation that I read in the book of Acts comes right after Peter's sermon. This is what it says in Acts 2, uh, starting in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. Look at that. They sold their property, possessions, thing they had. They shared money with those in need, and they worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So first we heard the first part, next one, we have to speak up. The second thing that I see in this passage is that we've gotta be committed. They were devoted. They were committed. Did you see that at the beginning, verse 42? All the believers, so that includes you if you're a believer, all the believers, where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. That word devoted just means committed to. That means that it actually is the word picture of somebody attaching oneself to something or someone. That's the commitment level, not letting go, giving it its full attention. They were committed. You know, you can tell when somebody's committed to something, can't you? You can tell when somebody's committed to, to working out because it's what they talk about all the time. I just got back from the gym and hell yeah, this is a leg day. And, and it's all they talk about. I gotta get my protein, I gotta get so many grams. That's all they talk about, right? If somebody's committed to eating right, that's all they're talking about is how to eat right. They, uh, if somebody's committed to their career, man, they're, they're talking about their career. They're giving themselves to their career. They're showing up early. If someone's committed to their family or their marriage, they're investing in their marriage. They're, they're getting involved in marriage classes and re-engage and doing things to, to build into that. It's obvious when someone is committed to something, right? And so all those things are good, but the scriptures tell us if you are a follower of Jesus Christ filled with the Holy Spirit, then we need to be committed to these things. The apostles' teaching, which is the word of God, the fellowship, which would be God's people, and to prayer. This is the early church. Now, these are our great, 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 great spiritual grandparents right here, right? Because of their faith. So, so right here, this is what they devoted themselves to, the apostles' teaching. We have it now in, in the word of God right here. So we need to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm gonna be committed to the word. What does that mean? Well, that means if the word of God tells me that I am to forgive people that have hurt me, then I don't get to hold on to my hurt and my grudge against them. I actually have to go, I have to work through it. I have to go, okay, Holy Spirit, I don't wanna forgive them. That's really hard. I don't even know how I can forgive them, but will you help me forgive them because that's what your word tells me to do. I wanna release it. If the word of God uh, tells me that I am to love my neighbor as I love myself, then that means I better work that out. 
How do I actually love and serve and care for the other person as I love myself? How do I do that? If the word of God tells us that we are to, we are to seek holiness and, and to walk in, in holiness with God, even in 2020, hey, then that means we can walk in holiness with God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what the word of God tells me to do. His way becomes our way. We walk in that way, amen? So, so devoted means I'm committed to the word. Devoted means I am not casual with the word of God. Devoted means that I'm gonna, I'm gonna study it. I'm gonna, you're gonna read it. You're gonna, you're gonna meditate on it. You're gonna let it fill you. Not out of a sense of obligation, like, oh, I gotta read my scripture today. But out of a sense that, man, God, I wanna know you. I wanna know you, Jesus. I wanna, I wanna open up this word. And, and John tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that when I read this word, it's, I'm, I'm reading Jesus. I'm getting to know Jesus. Devoted to it means I'm gonna, it's gonna have a rhythm in my life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna engage with it daily. And, and if you don't have a, a version of the Bible that's easy to understand, maybe you've, Todd, I've tried to read the Bible and it's, I just don't understand it all. I want you to go on your phone and download the YouVersion Bible app. You can even do it right now while I'm preaching. YouVersion, Y-O-U version Bible app. It's free. It's got all these different versions of the Bible. I mostly read out of the New Living Translation. It's got free devotionals on it. It'll help you engage in scripture every day. The early church, followers of Jesus, devoted themselves to the apostles teaching the word of God. The second thing they devoted themselves to was to, to prayer. Prayer wasn't something they did just when they needed something. Prayer wasn't something they did just when they were in trouble. Oh God, right? Too many of us, that's our prayer life. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I said, no. Prayer actually takes you out of the natural into the supernatural. Prayer actually takes the limits off because no longer are you limited by what is natural. You're actually connecting to a supernatural presence and power and person of God Almighty. Prayer is spirit man communing and connecting with spirit God. So if I'm gonna be devoted to my prayer life with God, that means I'm gonna have a rhythm to that prayer life. It'd be like, again, if, you, if, you, if you're all in and committed and devoted to working out, then you, are commi- you know how many days a week you gotta be at the gym. Like you know, Mondays are leg days and Tuesdays are shoulder days and all, you know, you cardio day. You got it all planned out. Well, why shouldn't we be more devoted to prayer than you are to the gym? This is gonna help you connect with God, right? So, so just, If you don't know where to start, you've heard us talk about the first 15. Take the first 15 minutes of the day. Five minutes in prayer, five minutes in the word, five minutes with a worship song tuned on on your Apple music. And you just listen, tune into God for the first 15 minutes. That's a great place to start. Now, if you've been saved for 15 years, you should be beyond 15 minutes. You know, give it, spend a little more time with the Lord. Spend that time growing. Build that rhythm in prayer with God. You know, I look back at, these men and women, these early Christ followers, they did this every day. They were devoted every day together for prayer, for worship, for the apostles' teaching, and that devotion shaped their lives. It forged their faith, and it actually impacted the generation that would come right after them. In fact, their devotion right here that we're reading about in Acts chapter two actually impacts you. It has changed your life. In fact, where we are today, we're here today because of these people. We're here today because of their faith and their approach to faith and what they gave themselves to and what they were devoted to. If they had been haphazard, casual in their commitments, I wonder what faith they would have passed on to the next generation. I wonder what the early church would have looked like if they were like, yeah, you know, prayer, whatever. Scripture, God, well, whatever, right? Missionaries, that's way too complicated. We don't need to send missionaries out. That's, man, that's so troublesome. It costs so much money, do you know? If that was their approach, where would we be, people? Where, where would we be? We are actually living today as the church in the result of their devotion. One generation's devotion determines the next generation's destiny. One generation's devotion will determine the next generation's spiritual destiny. And let me make it a little more personal. Your devotion is going to determine the next generation's spiritual destiny. What are we leaving behind for those that are coming behind us? Let me, let me meddle just a little bit. Parents, this is personal for you because if your kids never see you with the Bible open, if they never hear you praying, 
If they never hear you talking about God and the things of God, what makes you think that they will ever care to pray or read or talk about God or go to church or anything, right? You, your devotion, what you are devoted to is actually gonna determine your children and your children's children's spiritual destiny, the spiritual destination of their life. You get to actually shape that. My parents, some of the greatest parents on the planet, they're not perfect, but they were pretty close. My, I, I cannot remember a morning that I woke up and did not see my mom at the kitchen table with her Bible open and her notepad and she was having her quiet time. I can't remember, I can't remember one morning, can't remember one. I can't remember a night that we didn't gather for prayer. And if dad was home, he was leading prayer before we'd all go to bed, just a little time. It wasn't like 30 minutes, it was like five minutes. Five minutes of prayer before we all went off just to thank God for his protection and his grace over our lives. And, and, and you may say, well, Todd, of course they did that. They were pastors. No, they weren't. I didn't grow up in a pastor's home. I grew up in a coach's home. He was a football coach. He was, they were volunteers at church. Man, they loved the church. We, they put in me a love for the church at the very beginning of my life, but not as pastors. They just, they just knew that God was in the word and God was in prayer and we needed to, to invest in our family this way. They just did that. And I wanna encourage you, if you haven't done that, it's okay, I'm not judging you, but start today. I mean, start tonight before, before everybody goes to bed. Just blame it on me. Say, hey, Pastor Todd said we're all supposed to pray, so get in here, kids. You know, shut up, sit down. You know. Make them go around the room and just say one thing they're thankful for and then have a word of prayer of blessing over them. Let me tell you, day by day, moment by moment, you will begin to establish a new spiritual destiny and a new spiritual destination for the generations to come. Our devotion will impact our destiny and the destiny of those around us. And last, the followers of Jesus, they were committed to, to the word, they were committed to prayer, and they were committed to each other. They were committed to, to the fellowship, it says. The fellowship they had in Christ, which is where we actually get our church name, right from this verse in Acts 2.42, Christ fellowship, the name comes from right here. And I wanna point out that this is not an afterthought. It's not like in the scripture it says that they were devoted to the word and they were devoted to prayer and they hung out. No, they were devoted to one another. They were devoted to the fellowship of being together. It wasn't a secondary thought. It wasn't an afterthought. I've met Christians that are like, yeah, yeah, I'm into Jesus. I'm just not into that church thing. And I hear them say that and I'm going, they don't even know what they're talking about. And they're not reading their Bibles because Jesus was all about the church. He was all for the church. He came to establish the church. He gave his life for the church, it says in Ephesians. That he laid his life down for us. So if Jesus would die for the church, how should I live? How should I care about, focus on what he died for? See, before you and I were ever here, the church was here. And because the church was here, we're all here. I'm not talking about Christ fellowship, I'm talking about the church. And long after we are gone, the church of Jesus Christ, until Jesus comes back, is gonna be here. People, governments have tried to shut down the church. People have tried to shut down the church. Our leaders have been martyred in the church. Church has been persecuted. But man, it marches on because it is not a man-made organization. It is a God-breathed, God-ordained organization, breathing, living being that the gates of hell cannot even prevail against. And there are some things that God has for you in this family that you can't get anywhere else. You can't get it at your job and you can't get it at your gym. He's got things he wants to do in you. He's got things he wants to do through you. Things he wants, he's got people here in his body that he actually speaks to and he guides through his spirit that are actually gonna speak words of life over you. We're prophetic declarations that will help you step into everything God has called you to be. And you're not gonna get that at Publix. You gotta get it here. You gotta be connected and be, be a part of it. See, we gotta have people in our lives that people ahead of us with wisdom and experience that are gonna call us up. People beside us that we're encouraging and cheering them on so they can, they can run their race. And then people behind us that we are helping to lead to follow after God and setting a pattern for them. That's what God has for you within his family. And you read in the book of Acts, as you read through the rest of it, they cared for one another, they, they prayed for one another. Look again at verse 44. All the believers met together in one place, shared everything they had, sold their property and possessions. They worshiped together in the temple. They met in homes. They shared their meals, look at that, with great joy and generosity. Great joy means they were having a party. They, 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 God doesn't want you to miss out on the party. I don't want you to miss out on the party. I don't want you to miss out on what God has for you in his family. 
And as you commit yourself and renew that commitment to God's family, there are things that, you will, that God will do in you and through you that you can never even imagine. My life has been forever changed because of my relationships that I have made in the family of God. People that have prophesied over me, spoken the word of God over me, challenged me up, held me accountable, loved me when I wasn't very lovable, helped me be the man that I am today. Man, I don't know where I would be without the church of Jesus Christ. And, and I am no special. I'm not special. I'm more special than you. God's got it for you. He wants you to experience it as well. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you from the scripture around these two expectations of being a part of this family. Number one, you're going to speak up. So this week, I want to challenge you to, to have one God conversation this week with somebody who you know is far from God or you think is far from God. And I want you to have an intentional conversation. And listen, if you pray about it, God's going to get you right on point with that person, I promise. And you don't have to like prove the whole Bible to them or prove anything to them. You don't have to try to get them to follow you in a prayer. You don't have to do any of that. All you need to do is let them know that God loves them and let them know that God has a purpose and a hope for their life. And then you can ask them, hey, can I pray for you? And 99.9% .9 of people are gonna say yes. Now they don't know that you're gonna pray right then. And then you just go, okay, dear Lord Jesus, right there, wherever you are, you just start praying. They're not gonna stop you. They're gonna be like, okay, right? So I wanna challenge you to speak up. One God conversation. The second thing I would challenge you to do is I would challenge you to make a renewed commitment a renewed commitment to the word of God. I'm gonna get into the word. I'm gonna set a pattern and a rhythm. I'm gonna download the YouVersion app. I'm gonna make a renewed commitment to prayer. I'm gonna set time aside and I'm gonna grow in my prayer time. And if I have to start, I'm gonna start with the first 15. And I would challenge you to make a renewed commitment to this, to us, to God's family, to the church. And you may say, Todd, how do I do that? I mean, we're still kind of in this pandemic and COVID. And what do I, how do I, how do I renew my commitment? I'm glad you asked. One way you can do that is you can start serving. If you're online or you maybe don't want to serve in a way you've served before, we have ways you can serve and participate. If you've been on Dream Team, we need you back on the Dream Team. In fact, as church is building and we're moving forward and we're building forward, now more than ever, we need you in your place to help us move the church forward in this season. We're getting ready for Christmas. You can even just mark it in your mind. Okay, Christmas, I'm coming back and I'm serving at Christmas. Okay, you can, you can text the word serve to 441441 and we'll send you the information how you can get involved. Another way that you can be committed is you can jump into the journey. If you've never done the journey before and you've been around church here for more than two months, I mean, you need to jump in the journey. Every month we kick off a journey class. We got one starting this weekend at all of our campus locations. We have one online. You can take it online if you can't be at a campus for this weekend. And, and jump in. You're going to learn who you are and how you're wired to be a part of what God is doing through his church. And a third way that you can commit to, to God's family and connect yourself to the mission of God is by giving to the mission of God. See, when you, when you give, when you and I give financially, there's actually something spiritual that happens. Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if you haven't really cared that much about the work of God and the things of God and whatever, I would challenge you to start giving to it. Because as soon as you start giving to it, you're going to care all of a sudden. Your heart's going to be attached to it. And there's something supernatural that happens when we can take something as common and as ordinary as a dollar bill and it takes on some spiritual anointing to partner up with God for the work of God and the purposes of God that prevail and last. You get to be a part of things that last for eternity. Do you know that when we give together as a church, you are supporting missionaries right now today around the world that are carrying the name of Jesus into places that you and I don't even know how to pronounce, to people that have never heard the name of Jesus before. When you give, you're part of that. When you and I give every week, we are part of building a foundation where thousands and thousands of children and students and young adults are building their lives on the foundation of God's truth. And they're not gonna make the same mistakes that some of us have made. We get to be a part of that. When you give, we're a part of actually planting churches, life-giving churches, a lot like Christ Fellowship, all around South Florida, all around up the up, upper uh, Midwest. We even are planting churches in California. Dear God, they need some churches in California. You know what I'm saying? You're a part of that. Last year, we helped to plant 65 life-giving churches with 18,000 people in them. That's amazing, right? But it doesn't just happen. It's because we're devoted. We're devoted to God, to his word, 
to prayer, to one another, and to the mission that we have. The early church's devotion changed the world. And I believe that our devotion, when we're devoted to the same things, it's gonna change our world. It's gonna leave a lasting impact in our communities and in the nations of the world. I wanna pray two prayers today. I wanna pray a first prayer that we will all renew our commitment. And wherever the Lord might have spoken to you, whether it was in, with word or prayer, or maybe commitment to the church, his church, I wanna challenge you to just take a moment and make that personal between you and the Lord. And then the second prayer I wanna pray for those of you that need to make a commitment to Jesus. Maybe you've never committed your life to him. Maybe you've never turned over complete control to him. That is the beginning of you finding life and finding purpose and walking in the, the abundant full life that he's got for you. It's in that relationship with him, not religion, but a relationship that you get to have with Jesus. And so if you want that relationship or maybe you need to restart that relationship, that second prayer is gonna be for you. Would you bow your heads as we pray together? Father God, we thank you for your word that reminds us who we are and who we're called to be. I pray, Lord, that we would this week speak up for you. I pray that, God, you get that one person in front of us to have that one God conversation that will just help them know that you love them and are for them. And then, Lord, we renew our commitment to you. Right where you are, just make it personal. Whatever you need to commit to, whether it's the word, prayer, or the church, just say, Lord, I commit to. Make it personal. And as we continue to pray with every head bowed, if you wanna join me in this second prayer, this prayer to get your life right with Jesus, this prayer to turn your life over to him today, right where you are, if you would say, Todd, include me in this second prayer, right where you are, would you just slip your hand up and say, yeah, Todd, that's me. Hold it up high. Let me see it. All the campuses, yeah. Okay, we're gonna pray this prayer together. We're all gonna pray it out loud, but those with your hands up, this is your prayer. Pray this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I commit myself to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Make me a new person from the inside out. Fill me with your hope and I will follow you the best I know how for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on church, let's thank God for those that made that decision.